Um, I think, you know, most guitarists tend to sound the same um, because people have been able to make sounds like that ever since uh, the 60s, uh, power chords. But um, I don't know if there's anything that defines my technique specifically, but I did come up with something years and years ago, back in 1971, and it was something that was subsequently called Tapping by Eddie Van Halen. But back then I was doing stuff like this. <laughs> And so, you know, it, it enabled you to play very quickly, but it was actually very easy because you were, you were spreading it over um, uh, both hands. You were just, you know, hammering on and off with, with this. And interjecting with this one. So it's very easy, especially if you're moving around the strings to go up and down and um, not all of it's terribly musical, but it's a way of, of, of having a lot of uh, rapid fire notes, so if it's... And that, and that thing at the end, of course, is, is the ring. Um, I saw Richie Blackmore years ago who had a whammy bar with uh, when he was playing with Deep Purple, and uh, he was doing notes that were, that were like this sort of thing, um, kind of going into feedback. <laughs> And I thought, what a great sound, but I, I couldn't afford a guitar with a, with a, with a whammy bar, so um, I bought this cheap ring years ago and used it for these sorts of effects and found that you could do sort of wolf whistles with it. Sort of, and and um, so I, I, I use that a lot, um, particularly if you've got effect with it, you know, um, you can make all sorts of uh, wild noises with it, especially when you've got a band going so you've got enough uh, cloud cover with it it can be uh, really effective uh, the other thing is um, a slide as used by a sort of mizzy uh, sort of uh, Mississippi sort of Delta blues men um, um, and the idea of being able to sort of uh, slide into an O let's get that sustain off a more um, natural sound really and that's great for all sorts of uh, things including these sorts of um, things if you're if you're using a plectrum you can for this but um, equally great with with this thing the mainstay of many a, a heavy metal performance this sort of thing so they're really quite useful for doing sort of vocal um, effects really in a way. Um, so I guess, you know, they're all really sort of tricks and, and you know, the, the whammy bar, the, the tremolo arm, which has come on so much since the days of um, when Hank was using it uh, so well even, you know, the idea of being able to hit a note and then be able to do it, especially if you've got um, some feedback which I can induce via this guitar so you've got by just chopping the thing um, you can get all sorts of effects and the other thing you can do is um, by doing it this this way you can get a kind of a burbling um, effect so if you've got then you switch to the burble let's so um, you think that was a a pedal doing that effect but actually it can be done um, all with the fingers this is a Floyd Rose uh, uh, tremolo arm and um, uh, so the combination of all of those things you know sustain and and tremolo and some repeat echo means that you can hit a note and then um, hopefully it will sustain and and then tremolo it <laughs> sound it is but um, I love those sorts of things and it makes it slightly violin-y in a way so. that's me fading in with a fading in with a with a volume pedal
I remember years ago when I was doing an album, um, I was signed to Charisma Records and uh, Charisma wanted a hit single from me. And uh, I, I worked really, really hard to produce that, but I wanted to do it on my own terms. Um, the record company couldn't really agree on who should produce my record. So in the end I said, oh, you know, do you mind if I just get on with it? Because, you know, we wasted a year or so trying to find a, a producer that you're all happy with. And, um, you know, you, you guys seem to be in disarray about this. You know, they couldn't work out whether they wanted a punk producer or someone who was more established like George Martin or, you know, and it went round the houses and, um, and in the end, of course, I ended up uh, producing it myself, and I did get a, a hit single like, with with Cell One Five One. But the process of of doing that was was so costly in emotional terms. In other words, um, I did eight different mixes of this of this track. I was always going back in until they would eventually be happy with it. So we ended up with you know a drum sound that sounded like a um, a ton of cement being thrown at you as um, uh, you know, the the iron girder sound of drums that was so prevalent in the 80s. Uh, so there was that. And um, it was also the era of, of having, um, releasing two versions of a single. You did a single and you did a 12-inch version so that people bought it twice and um, uh, it was deemed to be more competitive like that. So I did that, but, you know, I... I was hearing so many contrary um, opinions from the record company. Um, uh, eventually, I stuck something on. I did the 12-inch version, and it was exactly the same vocals. And then everyone in the record company in England swore that that, that was a more distinct vocal sound, uh, not in, in, the, in, the, in the English office and in the American office. And I'd given them exactly the same mix as far as the, the vocals were concerned. So this was really the Emperor's New Clothes time. I just went along with that. But my manager at the time, who shall remain nameless, said, well, you must listen to the record company because they're the experts after all. And I thought, well, are they? Um, uh, but, yep, made, made that into a, 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 a hit single. Um, and then Charisma decided that <laughs> the price was too high at the end of that. We, we got you know, the, the hit single done and bought time on on TV, I put, you know, my own cash into it and everything. Um, and um, I did a tour of this country, it would sell out and everything. Um, but the record company had underestimated how many they were going to sell. So we sold out in all the record shops and fans were clamoring for it. And it was just simply not available. So distribution, you know, founded on the rock of distribution. But then again, you know, you must listen to the experts because they know what it's all about. Or do they? The era of screaming managers and the necessity for screaming managers, I think, you know, was something that belonged to an earlier era in the business when uh, you were dependent on record companies to make records, musicians to make you know, their end of it, and, and, and the idea of never the twain should meet. Um, it's not like that anymore. You know, uh, we're the record company. Uh, so if something doesn't get done, it's it's up to me and and and, and uh, the close team. So that's a different kind of emphasis altogether. So the era of screaming managers, who am I going to scream at? Me, you know, that's that's not going to work. We we we've got a kind of uh, a kind of um, communal approach to to managing. There are about four people that are involved with it. It's myself, Joe, Roger King, Brian Coles, and. We make the decisions together.